Welcome back to the Copywriters Podcast with your host, the world's greatest copywriting coach, David Garfinkel. David, how are you doing today? I'm good, Nathan. How are you? I'm good, and I'm excited about this week's episode. It's one of those things where we know it's important, but maybe we don't realize how important it is. And so without any more teasing, I'm just going to hand it off to you and uh, jump into this week's episode. Well, I'll just tease a little more and say it's super important. Okay, let's get into it. So three things can make a massive difference in the response you get to your copy and their your headline, your hook, and your mechanism. If you have a mechanism, of course, not every promotion has a mechanism. When you get down to brass tacks, the big question for any of these headline hook mechanism is how do I come up with a new one? Because you know, as a copywriter that a killer headline or a breakthrough mechanism can turn your promo from average or good to awesome and even spectacular. And if there were a magic pill you could take that would allow you to generate great headlines, hooks and mechanisms on demand, and there were no toxic side effects, you'd take it, right? Well, our expert author today, I'll tell you who he is in a minute, um, he's identified this magic pill. Not only that, he can tell you how to get it for yourself, but he's not going to tell you anything until I tell you this. Copy is powerful. You're responsible for how you use what you hear on this podcast. And most of the time, common sense is all you need. But if you make extreme claims, and if you're writing copy for offers in highly regulated industries like health, finance, business opportunity, you may want to get a legal review after you write and before you start using your copy. My larger clients do this all the time. So, Nathan, this could have been an old master series. The author is 89 years old, and it looks like he's still alive. Usually old master series shows feature authors that are no longer with us. Today's author is named John Adair. He's written more than 50 books, and he has a particularly good one on real-world practical creativity for business. Inside this book is the magic pill I was telling you about. The book is called The Art of Creative Thinking. And careful, it's one of six different books on Amazon with the same title. Fortunately, it's still in print, and we'll put a link to the correct one in the show notes. So if you're interested, you can get it for a very affordable price. Just click on the link. Now, I've read a lot of books on creativity, and this one stands out to me. It has both philosophy for being more creative, we'll call that philosophy a mindset today, and actions you can take, which we'll call tips. The one thing about the magic pill Adair offers is it's not fast acting, or let's say it's not always fast acting. Creativity occurs on its own schedule. Again, you can create an idea, a name, a headline, a hook really fast. With practice, you can get really quick at it. But usually, even with practice, it takes longer to create a good one. And to create a breakthrough one that can lead to huge sums of money, that can take even longer. Nathan, a few weeks ago, we did a show on creativity, and you asked a really important question. What do we as copywriters need it for? And one reason that's such an important question is our distant cousins, and we really ought to do a 23andMe on them to see if they're even related. In the image and name of recognition, the silly sector of advertising and marketing, they often use creativity for reasons we direct response reasonable people would consider a huge waste of time and money. So let's get into your question a little more fully. Broadly speaking, a great copywriter in the 1960s, I think it might have been Ogilvy or Leo Burnett said, if it doesn't sell, it's not creative. So there are a couple uses of creativity I really have a hard time seeing as being selling. Unfortunately, what I'm about to describe to you is what most people think of when you say creativity in advertising. But these are exactly the kind of things I'm not suggesting you use what we're going to cover today for. First, goofy, entertaining, distracting gimmicks that don't enhance the sale. 
emus that ride around in fake police cars, fantasy locations people get teleported to in order to make an ad interesting, pro football stars playing golf. Sometimes I wonder if ad agencies create this kind of foolishness because they or their clients are embarrassed about actually selling. And the second thing we're not going to talk about today are ridiculous claims that obviously are not true, but are so over the top that they're entertaining in their hyperbole, because no reasonable person could ever possibly believe them. This is what the advertisers are betting, so they won't get dinged under truth in advertising laws. Those laws say that a reasonable person would have to believe a false claim for the advertiser to be at fault. Not a lawyer. I'm paraphrasing, but that's the idea. But again, these ridiculous claims don't enhance the sale. In fact, they're so ridiculous that when you use them, it almost looks like you're embarrassed to actually try to sell what you're offering. So, yes, you can use creativity to develop both of these really bad example categories of stuff, but I wouldn't recommend it. But you can also use creativity to develop things that enhance the sale which in turn improves the response you get from profits with prospects, which in turn increases your profits. And everything we're going to talk about today is in the realm of tips and mindset fundamentals to help you develop better versions of these things, headlines, hooks, big ideas, mechanisms, product names, branding. You can apply the creativity material we talk about to any of those. And Just coming up with a better big idea can revolutionize the product sales. Same thing is true for many of the other things on this list. So that's what I want to talk about in terms of applying new levels of creativity. What do you think? I'm excited. I'm ready to jump in, man. All right, let's keep going. So let's get to the tips. Um, Adair has 24 chapters in this book, and there's really not a wasted word. He's a lucid writer, and he seems to know the landscape of business creativity to a T. I pulled out four tips you can use to take action. Some will be familiar, but the twist that Adair gives to these ideas make it worth looking at them anew, even if you already know one of them. The first tip is what he suggests calls, he calls it, use the stepping stones of analogy. Now, the particular kind of analogy he's talking about is nature. And here's an example for copywriting. Let's say you've got a course to use AI to generate a full set of emails for an entire campaign, just putting in a handful of prompts. Now, you know a lot more about AI than I do, Nathan. I don't know if this is possible or more to the point, even a good idea. But let's say for the sake of illustration, you have a course like that. It might sell pretty well. People really struggle with emails. They write a lot more emails than they do sales letters or ASLs, anything, ads on Facebook. So how do we find an analogy in nature, especially for something as unnatural as artificial intelligence? Well, imagine a snowball at the top of a mountain. Now imagine the snowball running, rolling down the mountain. As it progresses, it increases in size, picks up speed. So you could translate that image into a headline like this. What starts with one lightning quick set of prompts turns into an avalanche of great email ideas. Uh, I added lightning to the avalanche. Two, two, two nature analogies in one headline. Whoa. Inventors use natural phenomena all the time. Adair points out that radar was developed following the discovery by biologist Lazzaro Spallanzani Spallanzani, of how bats navigated through space using reflected sound waves. And dewdrops on leaves were an inspiration for the invention of magnifying glasses. So this kind of creative thinking might work right away, but it might take some time to develop the skills, the observation and imagination skills you need to make it work. If it doesn't work right away, keep trying. This one alone will open doors for you. The 
appeal to nature and some of the more extremes of nature just automatically paints a picture in my head, especially like an avalanche of new leads or whatever that, that, uh, it's, it's relatable and impactable is impactable a word it's relatable and it has a huge impact just right away yeah i mean one of the things about nature is it's different but it's real you know it it, it, it's not like it's something you just made up i mean the analogy may be strained but the nature you're analogizing to is real all right so the second tip is is related to analogy but it's not exactly the same it is Make the strange familiar and make the familiar strange. Basically, what Adair is saying is you don't have to reinvent the wheel to make it interesting and appealing in the marketplace. All you have to do is put on new hubcaps or paint the wheel a different color, so to speak. So the way it works is if you've got something everyone has seen and heard before, just to add something that doesn't really change what the main thing is, but makes it seem different or even more impo- important. Okay, marketing example. Suppose there is this famous gardener named Gardenowski, and he has this reality gardening show on, of course, the Gardening Channel. Um, you, in this example, are a shovel manufacturer. You get Gardenowski to use one of your shovels on his show and you get his permission to publicize it. Now, an ordinary shovel has suddenly become the shovel that Gardenowski uses on his TV show. Sales skyrocket, and customers imagine themselves to be just like Gardenowski as they dig to their heart's content. Nathan, can you dig it? I can dig it. Oh, cool. Gardenowski is the strange here, making the familiar the shovel strange. Even if he didn't change the shovel, and even he's if he's not that strange, it's that combination, you've introduced a new element to your product. Now, the same thing applies to making the strange familiar. Suppose you decide to build what, as far as I know, and I'm not a gardener or a shovel expert, but as far as I know, it's, it's an entirely new kind of shovel. It's a two-headed shovel, a round shovel on one end, and a square shovel on the other end. And it looks pretty weird, but you say it saves money, it saves space, also save time when you're digging. This way, square side down, it's a square shovel, but this way, round side down, it's a round shovel. Pretty simple and maybe a terrible idea. I don't know, might not even be safe. Again, I don't know much about shovels or how people use them, but this gives you an idea of how to take something strange and make it familiar. The two-headed shovel is strange, but there's something familiar about each piece of it, the round shovel at the bottom and the square shovel at top, or vice versa. They just merged into one tool and became familiar or strange. I don't know, one of them. What I like about this is the old theory of like, making what's uh, the, the 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 classic with a new twist. So it's not too threatening. I still can conceptualize what this is, but it's also not boring. I haven't seen this a million times. Now there's a new twist like uh, cherry vanilla Dr. Pepper. I know what Dr. Pepper tastes like. I'm kind of bored with it, but ooh, here's a new twist on Dr. Pepper. So uh, this is always a as long as you get the right amount of familiarity with the exciting new twist. Yeah, that's right. The, you have to keep fine tuning it and, and, until it works, but cool. All right. So let's go to the third tip, make better use of your depth mind. Uh, here Adara is referring to what we call usually the unconscious or subconscious mind. And he makes an unusual point in that, Thinking and feeling are intermingled in all parts of the brain, and we shouldn't think of them as discrete or separate. Both thinking and feeling involve many parts of the brain. Now, however, he does say that the unconscious is a separate part of the brain, and in fact, it's where the most important creative thinking occurs. Now, the issue here is speed. 
Never expect the unconscious mind to give you an instant creative solution. It might, but you never know. It does not operate the same way as the conscious part of the mind does. Adair quotes the poet William Wordsworth, and we don't really do a lot of poetry on this podcast, but I think this particular passage is a really good fit. And Nathan, get ready, because I'm about to do a dramatic reading. There is a dark, inscrutable workmanship that reconciles discordant elements and makes them cling together in one society. Metaphor, but I challenge you to find a better description of how the unconscious mind works than that one. The unconscious mind works best in creativity when you give it a clearly defined problem to solve and a deadline. However, and this is important, it won't always meet your deadline, but it doesn't hurt to ask. An example of what probably came from the unconscious mind after a period of struggle or maybe after doing something else entirely was the headline, Oil Under the Eiffel Tower. I think it was for a promo involving energy investments with opportunities based in Paris. So learning how to access and benefit from your unconscious mind is a gradual process. Adair doesn't have any suggestions for it. And the best I can offer is know that it's there and learn to listen to the sparks of ideas that come from within. I have one really awesome tip for learning how to access your unconscious mind. Have you ever had this happen, David, where you're at the grocery store and you run into somebody and you remember them, their face is familiar. They walk up to you. They're like, hey, David, how's it going? I haven't seen you since whatever. Hope everything's. And the whole conversation, you're like, oh, man, I know this person, but I can't remember. So you're like, hey, how's it going, man? How you doing? Yeah, good to see you. But you can't remember their yes, name. That's happened. Yeah. And then as soon as you walk around the corner, you're like, all right, good to see you. I'll talk to you later. As soon as you walk around the corner and they're out of sight. Bill. His name was Bill. Why couldn't I remember Bill when I was talking to him? And that's kind of how my subconscious mind works. And I know a lot of people the same thing. As soon as you let go of it and stop trying to force it, your subconscious mind goes, boom, here's the answer. So one of the things that I love to do when I'm struggling with a little bit of writer's block or creativity block is just go for a walk and get away from the screen and make sure I have my phone or something to write on with me. And usually about two blocks down the street, bam, the idea hits me and I'm ready to go. That's really good. Yeah, I, I've had that happen a lot, not only with people's names, but with remembering uh, the name of a show, a fact, a word. Yeah, I mean, occasionally, that not occasionally, it, it happens all the time. So that, that's a great tip. All right, let's go to the fourth tip. Um, and I guess now it's the fifth tip. Um, and it's not really as much fun as the first three, but it is vital if you want to get into the big leagues of creativity. And it's this. Deal with the discomfort of things that don't make sense. Not necessarily in all of life, although there is more and more of that these days. But in this case, it has to do with ambiguity and unfinished business. That is, you're working on a new idea, let's say it's for a hook, and you feel like you've got part of it. I mean, this is kind of what you're talking about, Nathan. You feel like you got part of it, but not all of it. You feel blocked. You need to be patient. You need to take a walk. And on the second block, <laughs> or wherever it happens, um, you need to take a nap or do something else. The unconscious mind is on a different clock, and it works different than the conscious mind. It probably hasn't finished processing the next piece of your new idea, or for whatever reason, it doesn't feel ready to give it to you yet. Um, I experienced this more than once on my new book, The Persuasion Code. When I started, I pretty much knew what I was going to write about, or so I thought, David, meet reality. Some of the chapters went at a good clip. There was work, there was research, there was reaching out to some people for permission to use their stories, but things were humming along. A few chapters, not so easy. Overall, what I expected would take three months to write took seven months. And that's okay with me. I know I have a much better book as a result. But I really had to grow a new kind of patience to put up with this and get it all done. 
And patience, I think, is a big part of creativity. So is persistence. Now would be a good time to quote Einstein, who dare quotes as saying, I think and think for months, for years. 99 times the conclusion is false. The hundredth time I am right. Of course, when he's right, it's a grand slam. So you you almost covered that in, in your last tip, but do you want to add anything to it about patience or ambiguity? Just the thing that you mentioned about uh, getting frustrated or losing your patience, uh, usually that makes things go the opposite direction. So that's why I really find the let it, let it go, go for a walk, take a nap, like you said, do something that gets it off of your mind, and that's when it comes to you. But when you sit there and dwell on it and you get more and more frustrated, it just seems like the brick wall that you're banging your head against seems to get more and more dense, and uh, the, the answers never come that way. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a hard lesson if you're used to controlling things and in other aspects of your life or work, but it's an important lesson. All right, let's recap this first part of the show, and then we'll get to the second part. So these are the tips. First, learn to use stepping stones of analogy. Adair was very clever in using something from nature, stepping stones to name this tip because it's all about analogies from nature. Second, make the familiar strange and the strange familiar. Just by adding an element that's unusual to something familiar or adding an element that's familiar to something unusual, you can have a new and interesting idea. Third, learn how to use the depth mind. This is the most powerful secret of developing your practical creativity and the hardest one to explain. Start by becoming a better observer and listener. And fourth, deal with the discomfort of things that don't always make sense because you won't necessarily get the puzzle pieces you need to solve a problem or create something new all at once. All right, let's jump into the mindset pieces. And these the, the foundational mindset pieces, these strategies are a little more complex and they have to do more with thinking and perception than just actions you can take. So the first mindset piece from a dare is widen your span of relevance. This means opening up your thinking, recognizing, realizing that not all creative copywriting solutions, for example, have to come from copywriting. In the area of product design, Steve Jobs used to go to high-end department stores to look at well-designed home appliances to get ideas for Apple products. This seems to have paid off. Adair gives a list of inventions where inventors got their inspiration from different fields than where the inventions added up. For example, the ballpoint pen was invented by a sculptor. Now, I know this may have been disappointing because, after all, shouldn't the ballpoint pen have been developed by a writer? But no, it was a sculptor who did it. A journalist who is also a lawyer, Carlton Cole. Maggi invented the parking meter. Uh, Personally, I blame the lawyer side of him. And Adair reports, a veterinary surgeon invented pneumatic tires. Then there's the interesting case of Jethro Tull. Not the band responsible for aqualung and thick as a brick, but the 18th century farmer who, as it turns out, was also an organist. He noticed that the way the pipes were spaced out in the organ would work as a design for a horse-drawn seed drill, putting in seeds in the ground in neat little rows. The leap between organ and agricultural equipment is a great example of widening your span of relevance. And this Jethro Tull is credited as having helped bring about the basis for modern agriculture. So I would say widening your span of relevance is taking thinking outside the box to the next level. Anything about span of relevance you'd like to add? Yeah, there's a phenomena where people who are in a particular field, if they haven't made a major breakthrough by like their mid 20s, chances are they never will. But then every once in a while, somebody completely out of the field will come in in their mid 40s or mid 50s and just 
bring in a new idea that revolutionizes the field. And they say it's because the person hasn't been kind of shuttered into the accepted way of thinking about that particular field. And that's one of the things that I love about I've never really niched down to one particular style or, or market for copywriting. I've written in all different venues. And usually I have two or three clients that I'm writing for that are in just vastly different fields. And I find that a lot of times I'll discover something in financial copywriting that applies to home and garden products, or I'll find something in art copywriting that applies to a SaaS product. And if I had only studied SaaS product marketing, I would have never been open to that idea. So yeah, broadening your horizons, broadening your ability to think past the one thing that you're focused on, all kinds of good stuff comes from there. Totally agree. And it's a great point. All right, let's go to our second mindset piece, curiosity. You know how in the movie, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, the salesmen were instructed, ABC, always be closing? Well, the acronym for curiosity is ABA, always be asking, with an asterisk. Make sure after you ask to shut up and listen for what answers you get. Some people are just like a parrot asking questions all the time, but they never listen. Not good. Okay. Remember the story about how Claude Hopkins pestered and badgered the managers at Schlitz Beer until he found out that they steam washed their bottles four times, and he used that along with other things he learned from his relentless asking to catapult Schlitz from number 15 to number one in the marketplace? So Clarence Birdseye was an inventor who was – credited with being the founder of the modern frozen food industry. If you've ever had bird's eye steam fresh mixed vegetables, you have him to blame. Adair quotes bird's eye as saying, go around asking a lot of damn fool questions and taking chances. Only through curiosity can we discover opportunities and only by gambling can we take advantage of them. Curiosity. Don't leave home without it. I tend to think that curiosity is probably one of the highest qualities a copywriter and a marketer can have. I have never met any great marketers or copywriters that didn't have an above average insatiable curiosity, even just about the world, not just asking questions about the product, but just a nature of a spirit of curiosity. Yeah, and it, it's very valuable. Okay, so um, our third mindset fundamental comes from the great scientist Louis Pasteur, who said, where observation is concerned, chance favors on the prepared mind. And Adair asked, what does it mean for you to have a prepared mind? Lucky for you, it's not a rhetorical question. He provides an answer. You have to be purposeful in that you are seeking an answer or a solution to some problem. You have to become exceptionally sensitive to any occurrence that might be relevant to that search. He says a lot more, but we can stop right there. Being focused on solving a problem and keeping your eyes and ears wide open are major clues all by themselves. One of my pet peeves is about how some people go about brainstorming. In the original method developed by Alex Osborne, you need to prepare, study, research, think about the problem you're trying to solve before you got into a meeting with other people and started spouting out ideas. These days, a lot of people think any unfocused, ignorant answer will do because they think that's how creativity works. No judgment, no boundaries, no preparation. Well, I don't think so. I think preparation and study feed the unconscious mind. You'll get better creative ideas if you've done your homework first. When you come up, what you come up with may have no traceable relationship to the preparation that got you there, but that's okay. The Roman philosopher Seneca is credited with saying, luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. So I guess we could change It's really corny. I guess we could change another saying to just lucky, I guess, because I prepared for it. You've 
mentioned before in the podcast the idea of priming and percolating, gathering up a bunch of stuff, getting a bunch of testimonials, getting a bunch of reviews, getting a bunch of uh, marketing from competitor products, and just kind of gathering it all up, looking at it, letting it percolate in your mind. And then that's when the creative juices start kind of overflowing. And I think that this is perfectly tied into that idea. Yeah, the most successful people do this pretty much across the board. Okay, so let's wrap this up with a recap of the three fundamental pieces of creativity. First, widen your span of relevance. Don't just go looking outside your niche for ideas and solutions. Um, Also, be willing to look outside of marketing, even outside of business altogether. You'll be surprised with what you find. Second, curiosity. Always be asking. And remember to shut up and listen carefully to the answers you get. What you don't already know can help you. Third, chance favors the prepared mind. Don't be an ignoramus and proud of it. Some things really aren't worth learning, but a lot of things really are worth it. Find out what those things are and learn them. Finally, one more thing. Even if everyone agrees that your new creative idea is good, you've got one more step. You've got to test it in the marketplace and see how it goes. That's really the final step of creativity for copywriters. Yeah. I loved it. A wealth of knowledge for today's episode. And before we're out of here, I want to go get this book now. Where's, I know we'll have it in the show notes, but where did you get your copy at? I I bought it from Amazon. Um, maybe 20 years ago and uh, they're still selling it, but I got to warn you, the cover is different, but I think the content is identical. And it's the art of creative thinking by John Adair. And you said that there's multiple books with the yeah. same title. Yeah. There, there are five other books with that same title. Okay. Uh, so You know, you, you can't copyright a title of a book, right? So yeah. anyone can use it. All right. So if you want to make sure you get the proper, the correct book, head on over to the show notes for this episode, episode 331, I believe, copywriterspodcast.com. And anything else before we're out of here, David? Yeah. Have a creative day. All right. And until next time, we will catch you later. Catch you later.